The concept of leaking an artist's music has been around for several years. As hackers discover ways to breach into a rapper's data in order to obtain unreleased songs that have been tucked behind the vault. Allowing such artists like Lil Uzi Vert, Playboy Cardi, Juice World, and Kanye West to have numerous tracks service online even though they weren't meant to be heard by fans. Nowadays, leaked songs are usually hidden behind a paywall organized by many on Discord under a certain event called a group buy. These group buys can go up to tens of thousands of dollars as people partake in these events by offering up their money for the leaked song to get released to the public. But what if I told you that before these group buys became a regular practice, a group of hackers had their own website in which people put in money for a certain leaked song to be publicized. However, they would have people specifically utilize Bitcoin when purchasing these tracks, causing many songs to start appearing all over the internet, resulting in some music companies wanting to take down the group for robbing millions off their artists. This group was called the Music Mafia, and within today's video, we're going to uncover who exactly they were, how were they able to pull off such a stunt, and if they are still active within the modern day. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. Before we dive into who the Music Mafia were, it's best to learn exactly how hackers are able to acquire unreleased singles. The ideology of breaching into one's data is not an extremely easy task as people have to discover ways as to how they could be able to break into an artist's personal information. In modern times, the most common way hackers are able to uncover unreleased songs is by sim swapping. The sim swapping technique is first initiated when a hacker goes out their way to gather as much information about an individual as they can. They typically secure this information by locating someone's social media or by paying for the information off of someone through the dark web. This causes the hacker to know such things like your birthday, your mother's name, or what school you attended to growing up. Now, all of these things are generally used as security questions to protect your data. Upon gathering the required information, these hackers could easily scam their way into your phone by them calling the customer service of your mobile phone carrier and pretending to be you. Since they know the information that would most likely be asked, they can easily answer the security questions and bypass anyone suspecting them to be falsifying their identity. Bottom line is that if I can convince the customer service rep on the phone that I am you, they'll switch the phone number over to my phone. Or maybe I pay an insider to make the switch for me. The weakest link in this whole chain is the customer service rep. And since they're usually not highly trained nor well paid, they're an easy target. Following them tricking the customer service rep on the phone, the hacker then proceeds into telling them that their SIM card is either lost or damaged and needs a new one. SIM cards are mini compact chips that are easy to transport around. They are inserted into your phone in order for it to activate. Once activated, they begin to gather tons of information and store it in their memory. So once the scammer receives the new SIM card, they can swiftly take all your information and use it to their advantage which is how hackers obtain the songs as many artists typically store their vaulted songs on a cloud service like iCloud. Since by then, they already know your password from utilizing the SIM swapping technique. All they have to do is input the artist's iCloud password and take their song. Although this method is commonly seen in the current era, the most repeated practice is people hacking to others' private emails. As they uncover an artist, producer, or a label executive's password and decide to break into their email in order for them to acquire any songs that weren't released to the world. This strategy has been around for quite some time and is the way in which the Music Mafia was able to gain so many unreleased tracks. The Music Mafia originated in Germany and mainly consisted of three members who I will be referring to as T, G, and Blue. Keep in mind that T, G, and Blue are just aliases or names as no one really knows who they are. Also, Blue is just a name I came up with since I couldn't find an alias tied to the third member. The three didn't live with or close to each other as they all met each other online. Upon meeting each other, they quickly realized that they all had the same love for music. In fact, they each fell in love with music so much that they all felt like they needed more. Since their desire for new music from their favorite artists 
and was very much present, they decide to learn how to hack into their emails, allowing them to access the emails from such artists like Maroon 5, Rihanna, Sway Lee, and Travis Scott. Now, from here, there isn't a whole lot of information on what happened, but you can kind of infer what transpired behind the scenes. So, as time kept progressing, the more they kept hacking and the more they kept obtaining unreleased music. They were gathering so many tracks that they could create a whole album of unreleased music from some of their favorite artists. This would be around the time where one of them realized that many other fans would want to be able to hear these unreleased tracks. After all, these artists have loyal fan bases who would want to hear anything from them, so they should have the opportunity to let those same fans hear the music from their favorite artists. This is when the Music Mafia came up with the bright idea to develop a website where they're able to share files of unreleased tracks with other fans. This would be in a similar fashion as to Napster or LimeWire as their peer-to-peer -peer file system would allow users to exchange files amongst one another all over the world. However, with their site, they swiftly realized that they could profit off the fans by blocking some of the songs off with a paywall. But they needed a way so they could remain anonymous so no one could trace where the money was going to. And at the time, Bitcoin was fairly new and wasn't as big of a cryptocurrency as it is today. See, by having people pay using their debit or credit card, law enforcement could easily find out who the owners of Music Mafia are. Nevertheless, these hackers knew that Bitcoin can't be traced, so they would choose the songs they liked the most and put it behind a paywall where anyone could contribute to. With all of this being said, their brand new website, MusicMafia.2, was born. They did have an old site with a different domain, which is the end part after the dot on the URL where they gave out the songs for free. Within the site, it would explain how the Bitcoin system truly worked through its frequently asked questions page. On the page, it would explain under the how it works section on how you would have to click on the fun me icon next to the song you want. After clicking the button, it would redirect you to another site called BitWallet. This site was mainly used as a way for people to manage their bitcoins by allowing users to either transfer them, buy them, or sell them. So by utilizing the site, many would be able to transfer their coins to the owners of Music Mafia. Heading back to the frequently asked questions page, they would go on to state that they run on a crowdfunding system, which means that multiple people can contribute to purchasing a song. Since numerous people can put in money to unlock a track, there would be a goal attached to it, in which there is a percentage showcasing how far people are from the goal. For example, let's say they put up a Maroon 5 track for sale, which cost 1 Bitcoin, which at the time equates to $2,000. And if you're wondering how much that is today, that is about $2,600. So as people kept putting in money to reach that goal, the percentage would slowly rise up, to portray how far they are from fully accessing the track. From here, the Music Mafia started putting up tracks from Kanye West, Party Next Door, and A Boogie up for sale on their site, fully depicting how they were slowly building up a business as they began making money off the songs since people were buying them. As their site kept evolving, they would keep needing more songs. Nonetheless, there would be moments where the Music Mafia wouldn't be able to get a hold of some tracks that they were trying to steal. Before we delve into that note, the next bit of information came from an anonymous source so take it with a grain of salt. But basically, prior to the Music Mafia's come up, the trio would reach out to smaller known hackers in hopes of gaining their aid to hack into well known artists' emails. This is when they came into contact with another German hacker group. Music Mafia and the German group eventually became tight but drifted apart after the success of the Music Mafia site. But later on, Music Mafia would ask for their aid once more so they could put more songs up on the site. If someone from the German group successfully stole a track, they would be able to keep it but not be allowed to sell it due to the Music Mafia already selling the tracks. Obviously, there would be some to disregard the Mafia's wishes and sell the track anyway, but it seems like those individuals never got caught. 
So by this point, the core three of the music mafia was split into three roles. The main person is hacking, trying to acquire unreleased music, possibly with a small group of people, another person running and managing the site, and another person responding to emails to those asking any questions regarding the site. With this setup, it truly seemed as if those three were on the path to success as they kept providing the fans with music. The addiction of hacking and loving their favorite artist's craft truly got them to this point. So they kept managing their newly founded site and developed it more over time. They even decided to hack Drake's Twitter to help promote their site even more, resulting in them gaining an increased amount of attention as well as more money. However, the notoriety of the music mafia doesn't end here. As on June 5th, 2017, two Kanye West songs called Hold Tight featuring Young Thug and the Migos and Euro Sewage Hands featuring ASAP Rocky fully leaked online by the Music Mafia. These two tracks would immediately boost the popularity of the Music Mafia website as it entered the mainstream. Due to the fact of the high stature that Kanye possesses, as well as the features from both tracks coming from pretty well known artists, it only caused all their fan bases to gravitate towards the site fully allowing fans to spread the site like wildfire by them discussing where the tracks came from with their friends and family, truly putting the Music Mafia's name on the map. So, with the newly found attention on them, the Music Mafia then decided to put up four new crowd-funded songs, which consisted of a Party Next Door song, a Quintino song, and a Maroon 5 track, but more importantly, they decided to put up Kanye West's most anticipated single, Can You Be, on the site as well. This caused the Kanye fans to enter a frenzy as they were eager to have the track. The track was selling for 2 Bitcoin, which equates to about $4,000 during the time. But in today's world, that is a grand total of $130,000, which is clearly a lot of money for just one song. Alongside the group buy, there would be a snippet of the track causing the song to blow up even more amongst Kanye's fans. Unfortunately for Kanye fans, the goal was never reached and the group by ultimately failed, leading to the music mafia to tuck the track behind a vault for a whole year. This is because the music mafia discovered how popular the song was and enjoyed it as much as everyone else so they wanted to keep it for themselves. Nevertheless. This is where things take a turn for the worse for the Music Mafia since they got shut down just a year later. However, there seem to be two different stories on how they got shut down, as one of the stories came from the same anonymous source that I referred to earlier. According to the anonymous source, an altercation between the Music Mafia and the other German hacker group arose. The origin of this conflict between the two groups is unknown, but due to the beef, the two groups decide to leak each other's unreleased music, allowing for numerous songs to suddenly appear online from both parties. They did this in hopes of catching someone's eye within the industry. Once someone realized the illegal activities that were transpiring, they would easily want to terminate one of the groups to help protect their own as well as their artist's money. And to no surprise, this exact sequence of events ensued as they quickly gained the attention of the Recording Industry Association of America, or RIAA for short. The RIAA saw the music mafia as a huge threat due to the amount of songs leaking. So they filed a DMCA subpoena from a federal court in the District of Columbia, declaring that the music mafia's domain registry, Tonic Domains Corp, to provide them with the information on who exactly owns the website. Alongside the subpoena, they would even inform the court that they believe that a user of their system or network has infringed on their member record companies, copyrighted sound recordings. Within the subpoena, it would state that they need sufficient information to identify the alleged infringer of the sound recordings described in the attached notification at the domain musicmafia.2. This means that the RIAA is seeking to uncover the names, physical addresses, email addresses, and IP addresses of the Music Mafia so they can fully shut them down, possibly even taking them to court and eventually imprisoning them. Despite ordering the subpoena, 
the Tonic Domains Corp paid no mind to it as they put out a statement saying, the company is not prepared to make any comment in connection with matters subject to the current ongoing legal proceedings. Fully allowing the music mafia to remain relevant and keep their site up, regardless of if their site ever got shut down, they supposedly had a backup since they seek to utilize their prior site, musicmafia.biz. In fact, they would even put up a message on their old site explaining that the site is merely used as a backup for musicmafia.2 and that if their main website ever runs into issues, their backup would immediately be updated. Nevertheless, both of their websites got shut down and the music mafia seemed to have disintegrated into the abyss as their site got taken down and the German hacker group has fully taken over. Not to mention, they also possessed the counting track, Can You Be? and also never wanted it to release, causing some to not be fond of them. Now, before we continue on with the video, I'd like to mention that the second story is severely similar to the first one, as everything revolving around the German hacker group came from an anonymous source, so the information is not entirely concrete. The second option of what transpired leading up to the website shutdown is that the RIAA simply took notice of what they were doing. Obviously, it wasn't good for business and they needed to remove the group from the industry for good. If you're asking me, this seems like the more likely option since what the music mafia were doing was severely illegal. So from here, what exactly happened to the music mafia? Well, there are rumors that they rebranded themselves to Private Friend and provided another hacker group site named Leaker.cx with the Can You Be track. But this isn't really concrete, so who knows if this is fully true. As for TG and Blue, it seems like they're off the internet for good as no presence from the music mafia has appeared since its shutdown back in 2018. They could possibly be living their own separate lives and taking care of the people closest to them. Although the core three members are on their own separate paths, one person that was potentially associated with the music mafia did get caught by law enforcement. His name was Spurdark and he was a pretty well known music leaker. Until one day, he got caught stealing and selling unreleased Uzi songs. He eventually received a sentence of 18 months in jail since the authorities claimed that he stole around $148,000 from his illegal transactions. And with all that being said, the music mafia has truly came to an end. But this leaves just two questions and that is if it's right to leak music from an artist and if their music does leak, should you listen to them? To answer the first question, you shouldn't leak music from an artist as it's downright immoral and completely illegal. After all, leaking a song from a notable artist is practically stealing from them. Since in order to do so, you have to hack into their personal data by utilizing their information, which is simply not okay as all of this information surrounding them should be private and only be known by them or close individuals related to them. On top of this, once a hacker accesses their emails, they take the song from the artist when it's not theirs, giving them free reign with what they want to do with the track. This power should only be held by the artists and not the fans as they're the ones creating the music. Not to mention, the songs that do end up leaking might not be songs that the artist wanted the public to hear. As Little Uzi Vert's producer, Don Cannon, best put it, If I'm an artist and I have a sketchbook, I'm going to sketch through the 100 pages. That's all my sketches. I don't want the world to see that. This is me trying to develop a new style, me trying to find out a new way to flow, me figuring out new voices, new melodies. And then the last page, you hear what comes out is my actual full sketch. Like the first page, I'm drawing a leg. But right. the fans are taking that out and saying, yo, I found a leg, I found a leg, or I found a hand, I found it. Like, instead of waiting for the final painting, which is the legs, hands, feet, uh, shirt, you know, chains and everything, it's like, they take the shirt, like, hey, I got the shirt. And it's like, those are the snippets. And I know that they're anxious about getting the songs, but at the same time, it's in a development stage it's like this fully describes how artists are always trying to evolve their sound and change the world of music so these test tracks where they are testing new sounds aren't really meant for the fans to hear since they get to hear it it causes many to switch up on their favorite artists due to them using a new unfinished sound alongside this 
Leaking a single from a certain artist can cause that artist to lose up to hundreds of thousands of dollars in potential revenue depending on the stature of that artist, thus hurting the individual financially since people already heard the track so they might not be eager to re-listen to it once it drops. So with that being said, should you listen to unreleased tracks? Well the answer is yes and no. You see, people leaking music from artists is a concept that will never end as there will always be people who want to hear a new song from their favorite artist. For example, look at Atlanta rapper Playboy Cardi and his fans. They always set up group buys for unreleased songs with some of the songs even being unfinished. But regardless if the song is unfinished or not, his fans will always gravitate towards it since he doesn't drop fairly frequently, meaning that they'll always be eager for new music no matter how it sounds. In some cases, this could be a good thing too. As we can see with Playboy Cardi's single, All Red, since the snippet of the song got leaked a year prior to its release. However, this experimental track was never meant to drop as he was only testing the early stages of his deeper voiced sound. Nevertheless, the snippet was loved by fans causing him to fully drop the track. This same event is also similar to what happened to Little Yachty and his song Poland as he dropped the track after the leaked version was gaining traction. But despite songs potentially blowing up from a leak, it's still not fully right to listen to unreleased music since you're not directly supporting an artist. But if you want to know more about music leaks, I suggest watching Maddie Balls' video or 1111's video as they provide a better insight on how it works. Regardless, there's always going to be a community of people who want to hear these unreleased songs. So if you're going to listen to those tracks, that's fine. Just be sure you still support their music when it drops or in any other way possible. But if you're an artist trying to keep certain songs in a vault, be sure to keep them on a hard drive so they remain hidden from society.